according to polls, make New Year's resolutions. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you right now, I'm not a big fan of New Year's resolutions. I'm not a big fan of New Year's resolutions because those same polls that say that about 50% of Americans make New Year's resolutions also say that only 8% of resolutions that we make at the New Year are kept. That's why I'm not a great big fan of New Year's resolutions. I am a fan of resolutions. And so I believe that a resolution can be made at any time. A hundred percent of us have done this recently. We've made decisions. We've resolved to do something. You do it every day. And so why can't we make the right resolution every day rather than wait to some special time to make it? Well, having said that, we are at the beginning of a, a, a new year. And I understand because many people think this way and operate this way, uh, they see this is a good time to hit the reset button. I mean, it is a new calendar year, so why not make some resolutions? And um, it's, as I said, it's something that people enjoy doing and a lot of good intentions in doing so. I saw this yesterday, the top ten New Year's resolutions. I imagine everybody here that's made some resolutions at the beginning of this year will hear what theirs made in this top ten. Number one, spend more time with family. About 50% of Americans have vowed to do that this coming year. Number two, fit in fitness. Pay attention to your health. Improve your health. Uh, related to that, number three, tame the bulge. You get that. Number four, quit smoking. Number five, enjoy life more. I think that would be related to less stress. Number six, quit drinking. Number seven, get out of debt. Number eight, learn something new. Number nine, help others. And then number ten, get organized. Now, I don't know if you were paying close attention or not, but one of the reasons I wanted to share those uh, top ten resolutions of 2014 is because I find it a, a little ironic that in those ten things, you can turn to a passage of Scripture where we're going to study today, Matthew the 6th chapter, and you can read about one of many of those things. As a matter of fact, I think that you might could break those ten things down into perhaps three things, and those are the three things that just jump off the page at you in Matthew the 6th chapter. Because in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord talks about finances, He talks about fitness, and He talks about faith. And while a few of those might vary just a little from those three more specific topics, many of the resolutions we make, whether it's at the first of the year or if we do this on a regular basis, many of them have to do with things like money, things like our health, and things like our personal lives, which would involve your faith. And so, uh, this is a very contemporary passage, I think you would agree, in Matthew the 6th chapter. And I just wanted to take the time to read this together this morning, beginning here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Chapter, or verse 24 is usually not actually included with this reading, but, but notice in verse 24 there is a call for decisions. And I said this a moment ago, 100% of us do this on a regular basis. We do this on a, a daily basis. We have to make decisions. And so uh, I think this fits with uh, the overall topic of our lesson today, uh, seeking first things first. And that is, you have to make decisions on a regular basis to do the right thing. And here in verse 24, the Lord says, no man can serve two masters. He's just calling for us to decide who we're going to give allegiance to. Is it going to be to the Lord, or is it going to be to something else? In this case, a mammon would refer to physical things or money. But make a decision. That's something we need to do on a daily basis. Make a decision to do right. We'll say more about that a little bit later. But then verse 25, Therefore, he says, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I would submit to you, there may not be a more realistic and relevant passage, more modernistic passage in your Bible than what we've just read. The New Year's resolutions that people have made in this country include much of what the Lord addressed on the Sermon on the Mount some 2,000 years ago. So what we're studying this morning is relevant. What we're studying today is powerful because it means something to people who are alive right now. I want to encourage this congregation, to anybody that might be listening online, or anybody that might watch this lesson at a later time, I want to encourage us today to seek first things first. If you're going to have a New Year's resolution, make this your resolution, to seek first things first. And, and this is something you can do every day of this coming year. This is something you can do every day the rest of your life. Seek first things first. Now, in particular, verse 33 of this particular passage here in Matthew chapter 6 is, is where we really want to camp out in the next few minutes this morning. Because Jesus said all of the things He said in the verses leading up to it to drive home this pivotal point. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And when you just look at that particular verse, I see three specific things that all of us need to seek first. The first of those is to seek first God's church. Now, uh, it says, seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew speaks of the kingdom a lot in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, as a matter of fact, 32 times he speaks of the kingdom of heaven. 14 times he just speaks of the kingdom. And then five times he speaks of the kingdom of God, like he does here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Now, I've taken the time uh, during other lessons at other times to go into detail, to, to prove to anyone who is concerned that the kingdom that Jesus is talking about here is the church. I think you can adequately do that. Jesus spoke often about the kingdom being something that was not yet in existence. For instance, when uh, He taught His disciples to pray, He prayed for the kingdom to come, Matthew 6 and verse 10. Um, when He went out to preach, He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, he also said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, and Luke 9 and verse 27, that there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom come with power. So in one sense, Jesus often taught that the kingdom was something that was not yet established. You know back in the Old Testament, there was a prophecy about a, a kingdom that would come whose uh, reign would always be. It would never end. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 you know, the, the kingdoms that were present during those days back in the Old Testament, they would rise and they would fall. And a lot of times they would rise and they would fall with a, a king's death or a, a king being succeeded by another king. But this prophecy in Daniel 2 and verse 44 was a, a prophecy about a kingdom which would never be destroyed. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus said, to Peter after he had confessed that he was the Christ. He said, upon this rock, or this confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
And so I think we should understand that the kingdom, in Matthew 6 and verse 33, is the church. It was something that was not yet in existence when the Lord lived, but then on the day of Pentecost, after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, some 50 days after that event, the day of Pentecost, the church was established, and many obeyed the gospel. They were added to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. But I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to say any more about proving that the kingdom in Matthew 6 and verse 33 is the church. Because I don't really think we have to do that. Sometimes the kingdom does refer to heaven in the New Testament. And often the kingdom refers to the church in the New Testament. But, but here's a simple way to make sure that you're seeking first the kingdom of heaven whether it's the, the church or heaven. There is no way in this world for you to seek first heaven, a desire to go to heaven, unless you're living on earth seeking first. And so you can't go to heaven. You can't seek first a heavenly reward unless you're seeking first the way you live on earth. And the way you live right on earth is to do that in the church. People that learn right and obey right they're added to the church, according to Acts the second chapter. And so I want to encourage you then, if you're a member of the Lord's body, I want to encourage you to have a desire to go to heaven and then let that desire drive you to do what is right while you're living on earth. And if you understand that, then you understand the principle of seeking first the kingdom of God. How can we do that in a practical way in 2014? You know, I could probably take a lot of time and give a lot of bullet points as to how that can be done. But let me just mention three things very briefly. How can you seek first the kingdom of God, especially where you live, the congregation where you serve? Number one, make sure you're at every assembly this year. When the time for us to assemble comes, make sure you are here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week, obviously, with every member present. But on the first day of 2014, make it your resolution. And stick to this resolution that you're not going to let anything beyond your control keep you from being here every time the church comes together to assemble. I always have to preface when I make a statement like that by those who say, well, I have to work sometimes. It's understandable. We get sick sometimes. That is understandable. But let's don't make a, an excuse for not being here when we can be here. So make the assembly um, a, res a resolution for this coming year. Be here every time we come together. Notice the church is a gift from God, but some assembly required. I'd say a lot of assembly is required if you're going to be a member of the church. The second thing, let's learn to care for one another. Let that, let that be one of the ways we seek first the kingdom of God. Learn to care for each other. Love one another. As Paul would say, let your love abound more and more. Learn to to put other people's needs before your own needs. You know, that's what agape love is really all about. Learn to care for others. And then the third thing, if you're going to seek first the kingdom, learn where you fit into the church. See, you know, if I understand the Bible right, we all are multi-talented, but in different kind of ways. And so, really examine your abilities, your talents, your passion for living life and for serving others and see how that can benefit the church. Find where you fit into the body of Christ. Because remember, we uh, have one head, but there are many members. And, and that's us. And just like your right arm might accomplish some things that your left pinky toe can't accomplish, every part of your body is certainly important. And do what you can do, what you are a, uh, uh, capable of doing to serve the Lord. Seek first God's church in 2014. The second thing I'd bring to your attention uh, as we look here at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, and that is seek first God's 
conduct. Let's go to the next slide. I'm not being able to advance it with the clicker down here. Seek verse God's conduct. Uh, here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, and His righteousness. Matthew, I said a moment ago, uses the term kingdom a lot, more than any other gospel writer. He also talks about righteousness more than any other gospel writer. As a matter of fact, uh, there are only two or three other passages in the gospel where this concept of righteousness is actually used. Matthew's the one that talks about it the most. And he makes some very interesting points about righteousness. For instance, a lot of people have questioned why that story is there in Matthew chapter 3 where Jesus gets baptized. Why did Jesus need to get baptized? That those of us who understand that baptism is for the remission of sins or for the purpose of washing sins away, a lot of people say, well, why did Jesus have to do that? Because it says in Hebrews 4.15, He had no sin. Well, Matthew gives us the answer to that. John, the baptizer, the one who baptized Jesus, wondered the very same thing. Why do you need to be baptized, Jesus? And the answer from Jesus Himself in Matthew 3 and verse 15 is, permit it to be so now, for it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. There's that term. Righteousness. One of the Beatitudes that the Lord would later teach in Matthew the 5th chapter says, Blessed are the pure, or rather, blessed are the, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then a few breaths later, in that same reading, uh, the same subject, the Beatitudes, he said in Matthew 5:10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. There is the kingdom of heaven. Someone has observed that righteousness has four meanings in the, the sayings of the Lord. Number one, righteousness is whatever conforms to the revealed will of God. That's how it's actually used here in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 10. Whatever conforms to the revealed will of God. Number two, righteousness is whatever has been appointed by God to be acknowledged and obeyed by man. That's the meaning there in the passage about Jesus being baptized. It was something that it was appointed for Him to do. That's why He was baptized. In Matthew 3 and verse 15. Number three, righteousness is religious duties. In Matthew the 6th chapter, we read about a number of things that those who are in the kingdom of God are expected to, to be known for. Religious duties, things like giving, praying, and fasting, and making priorities. That's all involved in chapter 6 of the, the Gospel of Matthew. And then number 4, Matthew 6 and verse 33, where it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Righteousness can be defined as, watch this now, the sum total of the requirements of God. So if you're going to make it your priority to seek first righteousness, that means you're going to seek first God's conduct for His followers. That means that well, whatever God requires of His people, you're willing to do. The sum total of the requirements of God. You know, Jesus, the Bible describes the, the body as having, obviously, the head, and that's Jesus. He's the head of the church. Colossians chapter 3 tells us He's the head of the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, rather. He's the head of the church. But, but the body has a head, but it also has the body. And what does the, what does the body do? The head makes decisions. And what does the body do? The body responds to the decision making, to the commands, to the wishes of the head. And so that's what we do. The sum total of what God requires is what the church does. It's what His followers do. And of course, we know today that the Bible is the one and only guide for determining what is right. Practically speaking, righteousness is something that this church is familiar with. It's doing right. That's what righteousness is. It's doing right. 
Like in Acts 10 and verse 35, but in every nation, everyone who fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. When you do right, you're going to be accepted by God. 1 John 2.29, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. People who have been born into the body, baptized into Jesus Christ, practice righteousness. 1 John 3.7, He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as He, God, is righteous. And then 1 John 3 and verse 10, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And so it's real easy to determine, according to this passage, who lives for God. And that is, the person who lives for God and is of God practices righteousness. They do right. The person who lives for self and does wrong lives for the devil. And so you say, how, how then can I make sure that I'm doing this in 2014? Well, two very important things. As I've already mentioned one of them. Recognize that Christ is my head. When I recognize Christ as my head, when I recognize Christ as my Lord, then I do what He says. The sum total. I can't pick and choose what I want to do. It's not like a spiritual salad bar where you pick and choose what ingredients you want on your plate. That's not the way Christianity works. When you say, I follow Jesus, you say, I'll do what He says. And so He's my head. I'm part of the body. I'll do what He says. He's my Lord. Therefore, I'm His slave. And I keep His commandments. And then the second thing is, you determine what is right and how to do right through the Word of God. You can't wait for somebody or something to reveal this to you. It's not going to come to you in a, in a quiet, still moment. And all of a sudden you have this religious epiphany. and Oh, well that's what I need to start doing. You know, the way you find that out is you open up your Bible and you read it for yourself. And so I would recommend, I would challenge you in 2014, every day, to seek first God's conduct. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek God's church and His righteousness. Seek God's conduct. And the third thing, and all these things will be added to you, seek first God's comforts. I find it interesting, and, and again, the um, part of this passage in Matthew chapter 6 that makes so much sense to us, something that we can relate to. You go back to reading what Jesus said here, and, and he lists a number of things that are important to us, that we worry over, that we strive for, that, that we want to make sure we have. He mentions finances. He mentions food. He mentions fitness. He mentions fashion. And he even mentions the future. We're concerned about those things. We, we fret over those things. We, we even worry over those things. But Jesus says, don't worry over these things. Don't fret over these things. He says, oh you of little faith, if you worry over these things. Someone says, well, wait a second though. I, I, I want to make sure that I'm providing for my family. And I want to make sure that they have good food to eat. They have a place to live that's warm and comfortable. And, and I want to make sure that I'm taking care of my body and my, my health. I want to live a long life. And, and yet, I am concerned about the clothes I have. I'm concerned what other, about what other people think about me when I wear certain clothes. You know, we have this fashion consciousness. Especially that is something that's true of younger people. And, and yet, I, I do worry about the future. I don't know what the future holds. I worry about my family. I worry about my job. I worry about this country and the path it's on. I worry over these things, God. And God says, that's normal. The fact that He mentions that we worry, I think, is admitting that it's, it's somewhat normal for human beings to worry. 
Well, God, how can I not do that anymore? How can I not worry? He says in this passage, don't worry. Well, maybe I'm just too simplistic in my thinking, but if I understand what he says here in Matthew 6 and verse 33, if I'll seek God's church first and I'll seek God's conduct first, then all these other things that I get concerned about, that people worry over, the Gentiles, he says, that they, they get worried about and frustrated over and, and they seek after. That, that, that'd be terminology for This is what the world does today. If I'll seek God's church and His conduct first in my life, here's something that's going to make 2014 the easiest year of your life. If you really believe what Jesus says here. These things that I get worried over? He says, if I'll just do the right thing, He'll give them to me. He'll provide those things for me. Now, there's, there's people that get on TV, and they, they make their living, and they attract large audiences because they preach the prosperity gospel. I won't call any names, but you can probably think of some of those preachers that are famous for doing this. They rarely talk about sin. They rarely talk about commitment. But what they talk about is God's blessings. And what they basically say is God is willing to bless you, and He wants to bless you, and He will bless you. And you know what? That part of the lesson is right. God does want to shower blessings down upon you. You can't disconnect that, though, from doing right from prioritizing, from living right, making sacrifices for the Lord. But when we do do that, that's what this passage is reminding us. It's reminding us that that's when God's blessings really come. That's when we can trust God to provide for us. Now, you know, here's the problem. Here's the problem that I'm convinced most of us struggle with regarding this promise. Have you ever found yourself cutting the church out of your life or dodging some requirements of God, righteous living, in order to make those desires happen in your life? Have you ever done that? I'm just going to be honest with you. I think I've done that before. A lot of times, I try to short-circuit God's plan because I... I think that unless I do some things, maybe I won't have these things that everybody wants. And, and I find myself not doing what God says to do in this passage, seeking first God's church and seeking first God's conduct so I can seek these comforts for my life. And you know, when I do that, I'm just getting it all out of order. I'm putting the comforts over the church and the way I ought to live. And that's not the order God gave these things. He said... Put the church first, put living right first, and then these things just naturally fall into place for you. Now if that won't make you worry less in 2014, nothing will. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The Bible says to everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. There is never a bad time to make a resolution. Just so happens we are here at the beginning of this new year. Would you resolve to seek first God's church this year? His conduct this year? And then would you just accept the comforts, the showers of blessings that He is willing to shower down upon you in this coming year? past Wednesday night, a brother responded to the invitation, and I said something I want to remind you of right now as we offer the invitation. The fact that the calendar went from 12-31-13 to 1-1-14 doesn't forgive anybody of their sins. Don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, God's given me this new year, and that therefore everything in the past is covered now. New Year's does not equal God's forgiveness. The only way to get God's forgiveness, and, and here's what I'm saying, the only way for you can really to start over right now, just so happens it's near the first of this year, but what if it was 
it's the middle of this year. The only way to start all over is with God, not with the calendar. The only way to seek forgiveness is not with the changing of a date. It's with coming to Jesus Christ and claiming Him as your Savior. And so we want to give you the opportunity today, if you need to start all over, to come to God. If you're not a Christian, that means accepting His requirements. Belief that He is the Son of God. John 8, verse 24. Belief, or rather, repentance of sins. Luke 13, and verse 3. Confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with your own mouth. Matthew 10, 33, 32, and 33. And baptism into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's how you start your life all over. Because when you're baptized into Jesus... You contact His blood. You're baptized into His death. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. And then verse 4 says, you rise to walk in newness of life. That's where the newness begins. Coming to the Lord. Submitting to His plan for your life. Maybe you've done that in the past. And yet you've got your priorities all out of order. You're not living for God day by day like you know you need to. And we'd advise you, we'd invite you to come back home to your father. Just like the prodigal son, he might not have been involved in the same sins he was involved in, but if you've lost focus and lost priority in your life, you need to do what he did, that's come back home. Come back to your father and ask for his forgiveness. And he'll reward you, and we'll pray with you and rejoice with you as well. Do you need to respond today? Start this year off right. Why don't you do it right now as we stand and as we sing?